our conference this year is on the integration of 21st century skills in the language classroom, which is a, a very interesting theme that uh, we are all meanwhile involved in, if we want to or not, because of COVID, we had to do a lot of teaching and learning online. And we will go pro more, more profound into this theme. We, um, we hope, or I hope, to see a little more about, about Belgrade than just the very large pedestrian zone, which is impressive, really. And we hope to have a very good conference, starting with our keynote speaker, Nikolai Slavkov from Ottawa University. Uh, this time he didn't have that long flight from Ottawa to Belgrade, but from Vienna to Belgrade. I'm very happy that Nikolai accepted the ICC's invitation for this conference because I think he's a, a, a extremely good expert on language teaching and learning and has lovely ideas how to make it more interesting. Thank you, Nikolai, for coming and may I invite you to take the floor. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much to ICC for this lovely invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I, uh, I was invited this year uh, for two presentations by the ICC, I gave, some of you may know that I gave a webinar a few weeks ago uh, and today this presentation. And so uh, when I gave the webinar, I kind of issued a disclaimer saying that I will be talking about the same project uh, today that, that, that I talked about uh, at the webinar. So uh, those of you who have uh, seen the webinar, I hope there will be some overlap, but I have tried to uh, have a slightly different focus to show you more research findings about the project that I didn't have a chance to show you when I did the webinar and to also um, have a slightly different focus of discussion today. So I hope you, you won't find it repetitive and I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, let me see if I can advance the slides. Um, so, dobro jutro to our... Uh, local hosts in in Serbia. Um, to set the stage, I'll talk a little bit about the theoretical framework, then I'll do a demo of two tools, a, uh, a linguistic risk-taking uh, passport booklet and a linguistic risk-taking digital app. I will show you a little more about the um, research that we do, not, not only the teaching that we do um, using these tools, um, and then um, uh, very, very briefly and, and not really in depth, I will mention 20, 21st century skills. Then I'll talk about implications and partnerships about our project. And then uh, we'll have hopefully some time for discussion. Um, I'm trying to advance. Okay, sorry, I was hitting the wrong. It's in the opposite direction. I got it now. Um, okay, so in terms of theories, uh, the three uh, kind of broad theoretical frameworks that influenced the creation of this project, linguistic risk-taking initiative that I will be talking about, are language socialization and second language socialization, plurilingualism, and positive psychology. So the interesting idea about language socialization and, and, and second language socialization is really the, the focus on language learning um, in an organic process process of social interaction. So the idea is that learners learn languages uh, not only in the classroom, but in uh, real life authentic situations where they uh, interact with others, when they see modeling of that language and they when they really use it authentically. So that's very important. It doesn't mean that the classroom is not important. The cl classroom is still very important. Um, but the social socialization aspect is also very important. 
The next point about plurilingualism, it's a very well-known theoretical framework these days, but what I really find appealing here is the idea that um, language learners have these complex language repertoires, and in those language repertoires, we may have different languages, and the focus is not on having a very high or equal proficiency in all of these languages, but more on having these unbalanced repertoires. So the idea that, that we may use languages with different functions in different domains, in different situations, and it's okay to not be perfectly fluent in all these languages that are in a language repertoire. And this is useful because it doesn't give us stress and anxiety of this high pressure of being, a, a, let's say, a perfect multilingual. Um, the third theoretical framework that inspired this project is the, the, the theory of positive psychology. So the idea that um, once positive psychology was introduced into language learning, the idea was that through language learning, we can look at uh, ways in which people thrive, in which people develop, in which people, in which people become happy or in which... Uh, in ways in which their well-being is affected in a positive way. And language learning um, does not have to be about correcting people and criticizing people and making them uncomfortable about the level uh, of proficiency they have. It has to be about making them feel good, happy, uh, and positive about it. Um, so in this global context, we created the Linguistic Risk-Taking Initiative. Um, there are global calls, of course, for innovation in language teaching and learning. Uh, there is a uh, very high uh, use of technology in all domains of human line, life. There's unprecedented migration patterns around the world. Uh, and then... Of course, there is the idea of linking language learning to these broader skills, sometimes called soft skills, transversal skills, or 21st century skills. So this is kind of the global context in which the project emerged. And in terms of the local context, we started it at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I've mentioned to a few of you that the University of Ottawa is a bilingual university. So on our bilingual campus, services, courses, and interactions can happen in either of the two languages, English in French. And the idea of the project is to empower language learners to use the target language in an authentic daily set, uh, way, a uh, setting, sorry, um, to take language learning outside of the classroom and to transfer it to the informal language learning domain. So you may be taking courses in English or French in the classroom, but do you really go out and use that language? Like you should, there are many people who take the language course in the classroom and then it remains there and they never use it. Um, and then, again, uh, there's a focus on positive experiences and, and fun gamification uh, in this project. So, um, I'm trying to advance the slide. Uh, thank you. Um, how is language, why do we talk about risks? How is speaking another language a risk? Well, because we sometimes are misunderstand, we worry that somebody may misunderstand us or that we may under, misunderstand others. We may make errors uh, and we may feel like we're criticized, judged, and so on. Um, so that's why a language, speaking another language, especially a language that we're not very comfortable in, is risky. It, it makes us anxious, it makes us stressed. Um, but it's very important to take linguistic risks because uh, the more risks we take, the more we increase our confidence, competence, it gives us pleasure eventually, and it helps our productivity and autonomy in using that language. So I want to share with you a, a little anecdote, um, a, a little story that happened to me just two days ago. Um, I, uh, I thought that since I was invited here for a keynote and my hair was quite messy, I needed to go to the barber and get, get a haircut. And so I said, I owe this to ICC, I will do it. And, but I was, I was kind of, it was last minute, it was on Thursday. And uh, I, there's this local barber in Vienna where I, I've been spending a lot of time. And, um, and normally I just walk in, but I, because it was the last day before I was traveling, I said, I will call him to make sure that, that, there, that he gives me an appointment and everything gets taken care of properly. And I speak very little German. I speak, maybe my German is at the A1 level or so. And speaking on the phone is very nervous making. Uh, I see people nodding, so I don't need to convince you of that. And I avoid doing that. I, that's why I usually go for the walk-in. I don't call, but I said, look, Nicola, you have to practice what you preach. You have to take a risk and make a phone call and make, a, uh, and make an appointment. So what did I do? I picked up my phone. I called him. He answered. And I asked if 
if he has any available appointments for today. And then he asked me a question that I didn't quite understand. I think he was asking me whether he needs to trim my hair or whether he needs to trim my beard because on occasion in the past he has, he has trimmed my beard. And I started thinking, and so that's why I thought he was asking. And I started thinking of how do I say, oh, just my hair. And what I and 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 the word that came to mind was cough. Uh, because I thought, okay, so like I just want him to, it's what what's on top of my head. Like I want him to 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 trim my hair. And I said, Kopfschneiden. Uh, which uh, many of you who obviously speak German understand kind of says, cut my head. Um, and he was not particularly nice about it. He said, uh, Kopfschneiden kann ich nicht. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but in the end of the day, you know, I, I, I managed to get my appointment. I went there. He did not cut my head. He cut, cut my hair. And I learned something out of this, right? I mean, I made this silly mistake. Um, I, I was a little embarrassed. I felt a little stupid, but in the end of the day, I did take that risk. And when you take linguistic risks, this is kind of the worst that can happen. You know, somebody laughs at you and somebody's not particularly kind to you, but it's a really a useful learning experience. And it's really a positive experience because I kind of laugh about it. And I made a few of you laugh here. So it's a positive thing. So I say, good job, Nikolai, you took a risk. And now I'm not so scared about calling uh, the hairdresser. I know next time I can do it. So this is the type of linguistic risks that I'm taking and that a project hopefully will uh, illustrate to you. On the next slide here, I have this more theoretical explanation of, of what a linguistic risk is. It's really a, an authentic, autonomous, communicative act outside of the language class, classroom where learners are pushed out of their linguistic comfort zone, just like I was calling the barber, and they engage in meaningful language practice or communication. And I talk about this duality of linguistic risks. I look at them as two sides of the same coin. On the one side, we have the language in anxiety, the discomfort facing your demons. But once you over, overcome that and take the risks, on the other side of the coin, you discover these positive emotions and successes. So feeling of enjoyment, accomplishment, success, and so on. So now um, that I've illustrated what a linguistic risk is, I want to take some linguistic risks for you uh, to demonstrate how that's done. So I want to play a game with you. I, I do this sometimes when I present this project. I want you to clap your hands twice like this every time you see a lightning bolt on the slides. Once you see the lightning bolt, please clap twice. And what I'll do when you clap, I will switch the language of the presentation from English to French. Um, French is a language that I'm not very comfortable with because I only started learning it when I got hired at the University of Ottawa as a professor, and they forced me to learn it because they said, we will not give you any promotions and we won't give you tenure unless you learn French. So that was a condition for me. I, and, and, I, and I passed my test and I got tenure and promotion, but I'm still quite anxious when I speak French because it's, I'm not as comfortable in French as I am as, uh, uh, in English. Uh, so I'll be demonstrating these risks for you by, by switching the language of the presentation to French. And those of you who don't speak French, you don't need to worry because you can follow the slides which are still in English. Et voilà. Euh, donc, à l'Université d'Ottawa, on a créé ce projet euh, avec un passeport de prise de risque linguistique. On a distribué le passeport dans des cours de français langue seconde et anglais langue seconde à l'université. Euh, les étudiants doivent cocher euh, les risques linguistiques qui sont dans le passeport. Euh, et ce n'est pas nécessaire de coucher tous les risques dans le passeport. Les étudiants peuvent choisir leurs propres risques. Et après avoir pris un certain nombre de risques, ils peuvent soumettre leur passeport pour un tirage au sort. À... Back to English, uh, you see in this passport, we have a personal details uh, page where uh, learners uh, write their name and their uh, email address. I actually have a couple of passports in my bag. I forgot to take them out, but I've passed them around so you can take a look at them a little bit later. Um, we also have um, 
Euh, alors, nous avons aussi les règles et euh, le raison d'être de ce passeport. Euh, euh, donc, euh, nous avons des pages qui expliquent pourquoi c'est important de prendre des risques. C'est quoi un, un risque linguistique? Euh, comment je peux participer dans cette initiative, etc. Um, here are some examples uh, of the kind of the core of the passport pages. Um, in the passport, there are over 80 risks. Most of them can be repeated up to three times. So that gives you more than 200 opportunities for authentic practice in your second language, whether it's English or French. We have the passport in, in both languages, depending on which language you're learning. And students are asked as they take risks to check them off in the passport, but also tell us how they felt, whether this was high, medium or low risk. So here I have examples of somebody who wrote their CV and motivation letter, and then they checked that risk and said that that felt like a high risk to them. And then the same person also communicated with a customer service agent um, on campus uh, and in French. And um, They did this three times. The first two times they marked this as a high risk. The third time they marked this as a medium risk. So presumably the level of anxiety went down after repeating this situation. Euh, alors, nous avons aussi des prix, donc après avoir euh, pris euh, 20 risques pendant un semestre, vous pouvez aussi soumettre vos passeports et euh, gagner des prix. So this is the end of the game. I won't continue too, too much longer, but it gave you an idea of, of what we're, what the construct of linguistic risk and what we're going for with this passport. Um, in the passport, we also have pages where learners can propose their own risks. So they tell us if there's something that's not already in the passport, they can give their own situations that they're involved in. And here are some examples. Uh, there is somebody who went to a tour of parliament and instead of, so this was an English speaker who had the choice of taking the tour in English or in French, and they chose French as a risk to, 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 to go on the tour. Um, there was also uh, somebody who called the bank, and you can, when you call the bank, you have this automated menu that says press one for English, press two for French. So instead of uh, choosing French, which was their preferred language, they chose English to, to challenge themselves to take a risk. Um, and there's somebody who decided to switch and speak only French with their Um, with their roommates said no more English. I will from now on only speak French with, with my roommate. Um, so finally in the passport, we also have this self-assessment page where there's these eight statements at the end of the semester of 12 week, week semester. That's the cycle that we use. Um, learners are asked to rate themselves based on these statements. So I'm more comfortable speaking English with strangers at the end of using this uh, passport. I'm more comfortable speaking English with people that I know. Overall, I'm more comfortable taking risks in English. I'm more uh, uh, likely to communicate in English outside of the classroom. I'm inspired to use English more often and so on. So we have these for English and French again, depending on, on, um, uh, on the language the learner is uh, learning. Um, this is all uh, consistent with task-based language teaching, action-oriented language teaching, the concept of autonomy, the concept of authenticity, gamification, and informal language learning. Um, and we use these, uh, this passport and later on app that I'll show you also as a research tool. So, so here I would like to share a little bit more about the research Uh, findings that we have. Uh, we investigate different aspects like numbers and types of risks, frequency, additional risks proposed, written comments, uh, self-assessment questionnaire. Uh, we do also supplementary questionnaires. Uh, we do follow-up interviews with students, follow-up interviews with teachers using the tools to see, to validate the tools and see what we can learn from that. Um, and generally, we do re get reports of increased use of the target language once we implement this tool. Uh, people report new discoveries, things that they never would have done before uh, had they not been exposed to this project. Uh, and then people also do report increased confidence and motivation uh, with real life uh, aspects. Um, so, um, just see, I keep... 
So here is uh, uh, something uh, one of my graduate students and I did um, some years ago when we were first piloting the paper version of the passport. We investigated those statements that I that I showed to you uh, just very recently, and then we we tabulated the data uh, uh, and we 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 tried to look how, how learners at the end of the semester uh, whether they agree or disagree with these statements. It's a little bit far; you may not be able to see very well, but <clears throat> if you see the red bar, uh, the are the agree and the blue bar are strongly agree. So you see for the most part on almost all statements, the agree and strongly agree are kind of the highest answers here. This is probably seen a little better in the next slide with a pie chart where I'm sharing. Uh, and there you see that the two categories, the red and the blue, uh, agree and strongly agree with these statements account for about 78% of, uh, of the answers. So again, this is good validation for us that the, that the program works, um, that, that it's worth doing this. Um, another uh, research uh, finding or another research development that we did was we uh, did a little bit of theoretical work with another student of mine at Griffiths, um, who uh, him and I uh, worked on defining the concept of linguistic risk within the framework of TBLT, task-based language teaching. And so we claim, in, 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 and, and on top of there, you, you might see the publication. So a lot of this is published work. So any of you are welcome to read it if, if you need more details about this. Um, but we define risks as a, as a special type of task. It's a special type of task that focuses on a high degree of authenticity, so real life tasks. So not necessarily just classroom activities, but things that you go outside of the classroom and you do in real life. And also a task that has an emotional or affective component. So if you remember the anxiety and the pleasure that we mentioned, these are very important, uh, we believe. Um, in terms of this special task. We also did some thematic analysis based on interviews with teachers using these tools. Um, and we, the teachers reported that their learners uh, um, interest and personal investment in the language increased after they used tools. Um, and the teachers themselves also said that they themselves made new discoveries uh, about how to teach language and that they're, they, they, they were engaged in these constantly evolving new classroom practices as a, as a result of participating in this project. Um, and so Ed, uh, my student, built this model here, which I'm showing on the slide there, where we talk about risks as something that may start in the classroom. So you provide strategic coaching, you explain to learners what the risk is and why it's important to take risks. And then you send the learners outside of the classroom with the passport uh, and, and, and you encourage them to take risks in real life. And they cross this bridge into autonomy, into the real world, into, into the wild, as, as, as some people say. Uh, they take risks. And then they come back to the classroom where they, in, in a cycle where they start discussing this and receiving more coaching um, from, the, uh, from the teacher. Um, another uh, research piece that we had uh, was done with my colleague uh, Martin Herrera, my colleague Jeremy Serrar, and myself. And Martin uh, looked specifically on the uh, concept of mindsets. And she uh, talked about this well known theory of the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. The, the fixed mindset being, hmm, I don't want to take risks. This is challenging. I don't want to do it. I can never do it. Uh, versus the growth mindset, where uh, people say, I like challenges, they're important, and they, they push me into learning. Um, so again, this is a publication that, 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 that is available and accessible. If you're interested, uh, you can read it. Um, and Martine also did surveys showing uh, she used the, the project for four semesters, so to a total of two years here that, that are plotted. And you see that she was also, as a teacher, um, uh, uh, maybe as a teacher evolving her practices. And in the first uh, semester, the uh, I believe the orange bar is, um, the orange bar is um, uh, the perceived increase in use of French. So uh, 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 people who say no as a result of, in, in, 
let me start this over. In the first semester, there was a high percentage of people who were skeptical about this project and said, eh, I don't, even though you're doing this interesting project, it's not increasing the my authentic use of French. Uh, and that's what we see over there uh, in the orange bar, which is uh, quite high in the first semester. But you see over the course of four semesters repeating this project that the orange bar does, uh, goes down, whereas the blue bar goes up. So after uh, you know two semesters, three semesters using this project, close to 80% of people say, actually, I do think that as a result of participating in this project, my uh, uh, my use of French has increased. Uh, similar for perceived added motivation, in the beginning, people reported a lower level of motivation, but after a few semesters of implementing the project, um, that perceived uh, added motivation uh, reached 85%. And so the ultimate goals of this project are to increase learner autonomy, introspection, awareness, agency, motivation, well-being, lifelong language learning. And all of these, I think, are related in some sense to 21st century skills. Um, when we think of 21st century skills, sometimes uh, variably called transversal skills or soft skills, um, I, I, I looked up the uh, ECML, the European Center for Modern Languages website, because they have done some recent work on it, and they uh, they focus on transversal skills, and they had a think tank. And on their website, uh, you might be able to see um, a description of what these skills are. Um, so they focus on things like global citizenship, education for sustainable development, media education, interpersonal and interpersonal 21st century skills, cooperation, teamwork, critical thinking, and digital literacy. Wow. It sometimes, it seems a little bit too all-encompassing, even a little bit wishy-washy, because when we think about these 21st century skills, everything becomes 20, 21st century skill. So I had, when I, when I stopped and reflected about this a little bit, I started wondering, is this really meaningful or, or is this just a really, really kind of, wide and, and, and big set of skills that, that we're talking about. But in the end of the day, I do think this is meaningful and it's not wishy-washy because it boils down to authentic and purposeful communication uh, in a given language and goes also beyond communication only because it focuses also on the role of emotions. It focuses on happiness, on success, on, on well-being, on citizenship. And this is very important to place languages at the heart of all of this because they are related to these emotions, not only communication. And that's why I, I, I think it's important to talk about these 21st century skills uh, in regards to languages. And I was also wondering whether linguistic risk taking could be considered a 21st century skill. This idea that language is central, that we need to focus on authentic purposeful interactions with others, and the idea of acknowledging and, and using our emotions, and then these contributions to su successful outcomes and general well-being. So, so perhaps linguistic risk taking could be included in this wide basket of skills that we can coach students for. Okay. Um, I hope I didn't tire you too much with the research. I will now uh, demo the app that we develop after we develop the passport, just to kind of switch it up a little bit and 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 show you something slightly different. Um, the app was developed developed because, of course, we cater to digital natives, and uh, a lot of our students told us, "Yeah, this passport is kind of nice and neat, but I forget it at home, or I lost it, or you know, people just don't carry them as often as they carry their phones with them." And of course, digital technology gives us a lot more features that we can add into uh, in comparison with the paper booklet. Um, and so, I currently work with two student developers, Markello Letang and Scott Zhang, that I want to acknowledge for doing an amazing job on this project. Um, and here is a quick demo of the uh, the digital app that we have developed and we've been using for the past year uh, and will continue to use next year. This is the load, load up splash screen. When you open the app, you land on something we call a risk hub. And so this is the main screen. If you see on top, there is a little uh, section called risk trending. And so this kind of rotates and shows you what other risks uh, other learners are taking kind of to motivate you. The next section, if you look kind of in the middle of the slide, it's a, it says take a risk 
risk. So there you can choose risks based on reading, writing, uh, listening, oral interaction, or by theme, academic, everyday life, technology on campus, and so on. Uh, and if you click on one of those buttons, it shows you the risks and you can choose them. There is a plus button as well there if you see the if if you click on that button, you can propose a new risk that's not included in the app. And there's a, another kind of a shaped arrow button that you can uh, press. It's kind of like almost like playing a slot machine in a casino where you take a random risk. You press that button and it generates a random risk and, and sends you for this random challenge. Um, I will now show you a little bit the menu of the um, app. Uh, if you see on top there, there's settings and my passport details. Uh, when you click there, again, you see this kind of visual representation of, of something that reminds us of a passport. Here, we've also integrated um, a dashboard where you can see how many risks you've taken and what level you've reached based on, on the number of risks taken. So you see this, this user here, which is me as a test user, uh, reached the red level. But if I take more risks, I may reach the gold level or the platinum level and so on. Um, if I go back to the menu, again, we have things about explanations about why linguistic risk-taking is important. We have a tutorial on how to use the app. Uh, we have a leaderboard. That's something that we implemented. So the, the, the learners who take the most risks go up on the leaderboard. This is me as a tester again. So this is not real. Um, but you see, I have uh, 35 risks there and I'm leading. Um, which is not true. Um, and then um, let me go back to the risk hub just to uh, demonstrate how you take a risk in the app. If you go to the middle of the uh, middle section of this screen here, um, uh, if you see where it says spoken interaction, let's pretend that I want to take a spoken interaction risk. And so when I click on that spoken interaction, it shows me uh, uh, 44. I think there's a, a list of 44 different spoken interactions that I can do. I can scroll up and down in this and imagine that I want to imagine that I went to the health uh, services of the university and there you can receive health services in either French or English and I decided to use my French there which is my risk language and so I chose that and when you get on that screen you're asked to choose the risk level um, which can be low or high just to tell us how you felt about this particular risk and the fun level to tell us whether you enjoyed this or not um, and so I can drag this slider and uh, as you see, too high here, because to me, this is always a high risk if I use the language that I don't know very well at the doctors. Uh, and the fun level at the doctors will leave it at low. Further low down on the screen, there's also a section where you can write comments. And here I wrote, wrote a tentative comment. Well, I didn't understand all the medical jargon that the doctor used, but I got the right medication. And so it was still a successful interaction. I might as well describe here the same, the, the interaction that I had with the barber in Vienna, if I, if I had German uh, in this, uh, right? Um, and maybe the fun level would be a little bit higher with the barber. Um, and then when I proceed, it gives me this OK button uh, and congratulates me on taking a risk. Um, I'll show you briefly also the uh, the statistics module so learners can analyze the risks that they have taken. So you, if you click on the stats button at the bottom of the app, it brings you to this page where you can look at the risks you've taken by frequency. So it can tell you over the past month or past several months how many risks you've taken. And it shows you this graph. Um, it can also, you can also kind of review your risks by skill. So here, I think I, I, it's not very well visible, but that bar ch chart shows that I think I've taken a lot of oral interactions. I think that's what the blue one is, but I haven't done any writing risks. So if you see the kind of almost zero, the, the, the lowest bar is writing risk. So maybe this will motivate me to take more writing risks um, and, and indicate that in the app. Um, I can also analyze by... Um, theme. So here we have on campus, uh, I can't read the other ones very well, um, academic, technology, leisure, and you see that I've taken mostly on campus risks. So perhaps I'll choose something else next time just to, to, to expose myself to different situations. And then at the end, after, like I said, a one semester, um, the learners can submit their passport and then they can win a prize for participating in this project with this app. So if well, I submit my, my uh, passport and I may win a prize at the end of the semester. 
I'll go into a little more research findings, again, acknowledging some of the work that I've done with my students and colleagues. Um, my student, graduate student, Farhad Rudi, was very interested in trying to evaluate to what degrees this project gamified. Is the passport booklet and the passport app gamified enough to kind of engage learners and keep them keep them motivated. Uh, and what he did is he developed this tool, this rubric for evaluating the project. I won't go over it, first of all, because it's quite small. You can't and see it from here, but also because we probably don't have too, too much time. Um, but essentially, his conclusion after developing this rubric and, and evaluating the, the app and the passport was that hmm, based on the results, this was there was a modest degree of gamification in the app so it's not really um uh, a very a very um, catchy and addictive and and really gamified where learners grab it and they're like okay i'm, I'm gonna use this all the time we are not there yet um and um but we are working on it um, another um, research aspect uh, that, that, that I want to mention, this is something that's not published yet, but we're working on trying to figure out if with repeated risks, uh, anxiety goes down. So imagine the first time it's high level, high risk, second time, maybe medium, third time, maybe low. This is very difficult to kind of in real life to, 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 to get some sort of perfect result with it. So the results are definitely not perfect. Um, and so we, so, but we, we tabulated the existing data that we had from the paper passport and from the app, we, we harvested it from the back end. Um, and so we analyzed different patterns. So we found a decision ascending pattern, so from higher to lower, we found an ascending pattern. So sometimes we may say that something is low risk the first time and then high risk the second time, which would be uh, surprising, but it does happen. We found a const constant pattern, that's the green arrow there, or a variant pattern going up and down. Um, and here we uh, have a pie chart that indicates the descending pattern. This is what we're most interested in, and this is what we hope the learners would, would achieve. And we have 17% uh, of, of risks where we found a descending pattern. Um, and the largest majority of, uh, of risks taken showed the, are the green 57%, which is the constant pattern. So basically it doesn't change. Uh, first time you say this is medium risk, second time you say it's medium risk, and third time you say it's medium risk again. Um, and so, um, like I said, this is not a perfect result. Uh, and there are possible there, there there are different possible explanations for this it could be that the the 12 weeks short semester that we have for learners doesn't give them enough time to uh, really uh, practice enough to, to, to decrease that level of perceived risk. So one thing that we will try to do is try to follow them for a few years and see if there's a, a pattern in that case. But nonetheless, the 17% um, there that we have is still a fairly encouraging finding that there is some uh, risks where the level of anxiety or the level of risk goes down. Um, I have a few more slides here and soon I'll wrap up. But this one is quite interesting to me because uh, we administered a separate questionnaire uh, where we asked them whether this app was, this was specifically focusing on the app and we, was, uh, we were asking them whether this app was useful or fun. And so we had different options. One was this was useful and fun. One was this was useful but not fun. One was this was fun, but not useful. And one was, this was neither fun nor useful. And so here we have the answers. Uh, we see the biggest piece of the pie, 55% said it was both fun and yes, useful. So this is very encouraging. The second biggest piece of the pie and the pie, the red one, 28% said, yeah, this was useful, but not that, that much fun. And then I can, unfortunately, I can't read this very well, but I think the, uh, the the smallest one, the blue two per three percent is this was neither fun nor useful. So see, you know, in a sample of sixty five people, we have two people who said 
I don't like this project. It's just not for me. And, and this is completely fine, right? I mean, for those people, we say, you know what? Maybe we need to find something different for you. And we need to give you an option to opt out, opt out of it. We don't want to force people to participate in something that doesn't help them and they don't believe in it. But as you see also for the vast majority of our participants, this was useful and fun. So again, it's, it's, it's validating evidence for us. Um, another thing that we did is we looked at some, we really wanted to validate the app and see what part of the app is is interesting for you and what part is not so interesting. So we had in a survey, we had learners uh, rank the different features of the app. So remember the statistics module, the leaderboard, and so on. And so on this next graph here that I, or bar chart that I'm showing here, uh, we have them ranked on a scale. And interestingly, you see that the, the bar Bottom, the leaderboard board is at the bottom. So we often think of leaderboards as something that is very catchy and very uh, interesting. And maybe it is, but maybe it's just for a small number of people. And maybe some people just kind of want to shy away from them. Um, but uh, what seemed to be most interesting in our app for our users was what you see at the very top of the pyramid there, which was the user stats. So those modules where they can kind of track their own risks and see what they have done over the past number of weeks or months, uh, whether uh, they could uh, sub-analyze them by frequency or by skill or by theme, that seemed to be something that's most engaging for them. So what are we going to do? We're going to expand that module and we're going to uh, make it more sophisticated to hopefully give our users in the future more satisfaction of this. So uh, briefly, uh, a few comments we have many many we're still analyzing a large large corpus of different comments that were provided to us these are just a couple that i'm sharing with you here um, there's somebody who said this is a good initiative and i love it and it pushed me uh, to use english practice for my good well done uh, the next comment is in french it's uh, we've had we have got this comment many many years ago but i really like it uh, i don't want to say many many years ago a few years ago uh, so somebody said that this passport, this is a person who, who describes themselves as somebody who has a high level of anxiety. And they say, I have a high level of anxiety, but exposing me to this concept of linguistic risk-taking and to the tool that you have developed really empowered me and gave me motivation to apply for a bilingual uh, job as a train um, attendant on Via Rail, that, which is the, the National Canadian train company where you, you must speak both English and French. And, and for somebody with high anxiety to, to gather the courage to put in an application for that job and interview in that language that they're not comfortable in, it's a very it's very empowering and very validating. Uh, we have another comment. Uh, somebody says, oh, it's a really cool thing to have because I've never heard of linguist risk-taking before. Uh, and before I came to this French class. So it does for sure kind of push me to do things that I would have never done before. Um, so again, on our campus, there's so many opportunities to use both languages, but once you're kind of in the habit of using only one language, then you really need to be shaken out of your comfort zone and, 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 and kind of pushed into that um, second language. Um, there's another person who talks about growth. So remember the growth mindset. This was kind of music to my colleague, Martine Rion, who was working on mindset and growth because she says, look, the students are saying that over one semester, uh, you know, I had these negative thoughts. There's all, I was putting all this pressure on myself. And, but eventually I realized that I shouldn't be pressuring, pressuring myself. And it helped me like, just practice my language regardless of the mis mistakes that I make. I'm not afraid anymore to make mistakes and I have grown a lot. Um, so again, there's, this was very um, validating and, and powerful for us. Um, this project, I keep calling it a pilot project because I really want to continue to test it and validate it. We have a lot to learn in it, but it has also grown quite a bit in the sense of multiple people around the world have contacted us and, and, and developed partnerships with us, uh, developing their own initiatives based on, on, on linguistic risk-taking. So for example, in Japan, there's um at Kanda University of International St uh, Studies, there is a similar passport that was developed in France, uh, a language on minority languages uh, in Occitanie. Um, 
the ECML, um, did a modification and created the handbook of uh, uh, secret agents handbook of uh, of challenges. Uh, and uh, the University of Vienna, my colleagues, uh, Eva Feta and uh, a graduate student, Stephanie Czajka, uh created the booklet called uh, Riskia Vas. Um, and so we have quite a few partnerships and collaborations mushrooming uh, around the world. Okay, I think I've showed you enough. I have maybe three, four minutes left. Uh, what I'll do is I'll kind of sum it all up. Uh, um, linguistic risk-taking, uh, I put it out to you to, 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 to think, to reflect on this and think whether um, linguistic risk taking can perhaps be considered a 21st century skill um, because it helps learners manage their emotions. It helps them lower their anxiety and increase their confident, conf confidence and competence. It pushes learners into authentic daily situations where language is at the heart of successful interactions in daily life, in professional, personal, global citizenship, digital engagement. Uh, linguistic risk-taking also involves strategic coaching. So in the classroom, we can coach learners strategically uh, through reflection and through practice activities, through goal setting, through modeling. Um, it's not a self-driven process taking linguistic risks. We really need to push learners to do it in order for them to experience the benefits of it. Um, and overall, it remains an innovative 21st century approach uh, to language teaching that uh, I believe increases learner engagement. Here's a few sample publications by, by our team. Uh, they're available. So if anyone's interested, of course, you can read more about our work. Uh, and I want to conclude by um, being able to switch the slide properly. Thank the, uh, the, 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 the professors, the students, uh, the staff members, and the partners that have um, been part of this project for a few years now. I also want to acknowledge the different funders that we have, the institute where I work, the government of Canada um, as well. Uh, I believe this is it. Kvala vam. Merci, danke schön, thank you. Any questions? Okay, right. So I'll take over now with some questions. First on site, we have some time, and then later on, move on to the questions that we might be getting online. Uh, where Michael is looking into that. So I would like, first of all, to ask you on site, any interesting comments or questions for this very interesting and talk that has got me a lot to reflect about my own teaching. So we do have microphones, just hold on, we have two. Yeah. As a language teacher, I think I can make myself heard, but... Oh, right. Is it on? Should yep. I go on? Yep. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much. First of all, it was wonderful. Very interesting project. Um, I I had a question, but then you showed something about the collaborations you had in different countries so because in Canada you have English and French as second languages so the students get the chance to go out and practice I started to think about my context I'm from Turkey and in Turkey English is the foreign language the additional language um, and unfortunately my students do not have the chance to go out and take those risks but then you show those examples from um, Japan and the other countries. So can you elaborate more on that? How did they do it? Yeah, it's uh, it, this is a very good question. Um, in fact, even in Canada, um, this is sometimes a problem, especially with English, uh, uh, because uh, sometimes people even say, well, you're giving us this project but English is all around us. So we, uh, Ottawa is in, uh, is in an English speaking on, um, province, Ontario. It's on the border between um, the French speaking province, Quebec, and the English speaking province, um, 
uh, Ontario, but like English is quite dominant in Ottawa. So sometimes people say, it's not really a risk. I have to do this anyway all the time, right? In English, but in French, it is a risk much more because, uh, uh, you know, there are the opportunities to use it, but you have to really uh, push yourself. But to kind of get to your question about how do we do this in a context when the language is not widely spoken, it's certainly a higher challenge, but you would be surprised how many different places there might be uh, that you, you might be able to to practice that language. So, for example, uh, at that university in Japan, it was done with English, even though, uh, you know, Japan, uh, English is not the national language of Japan. And so... Um, Certainly, you can take a look at their passport. You, you'll see that a lot of the um, opportunities that they list there are available at their university, so at their institution. So that was that is usually the first step. What institution are you using? And can you use some of its resources, offices, different people that you, you can direct the students to go and talk to? So you imagine you, 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 you work at a small language school, and then you say to the students, you know, take a risk and go to the secretary, and when you register next Next time, try to speak in English to her. It, and, and for example, you, you may see if the, there is a secretary who speaks English or, or who doesn't, right? Uh, you may want to check out international organizations. You may want to also include online opportunities, right? So this is actually, uh, uh, there's vast opportunities for this. For example, you can tell them, write a review of this local coffee shop that you went to and, I, and you had delicious burek. Uh, in Turkey, right? And, and a nice coffee. Go to maybe go to Google reviews and write a Google review in English for that. So it's certainly not easy. It's certainly a challenge, but especially with English, there's lots of things that you can do. And certainly the list of risks would be different from the list of risks that I demonstrated for our passport. But, but this is possible and this is how people have done it. Thank you so much. I have just one quick question about the risks. You give the opportunity to students to rate them, right? They decide if that risk is high, medium, or low. Were they trained before? Like, how do they decide that that's a high risk? Yeah, so uh, a very good question. Uh, we tell them to, uh, it, this is a self-report. So we just tell them, tell us how you felt at that time. You have these three options. So was this high, medium, or low? Actually, in the app, there's a there's there's a more fine-grained scale. It's, I think, a five or a seven-point scale. So they dry, so with their finger, they dry, they drag this uh, slider. And it's really based because we, part of the exercise is for them to, come to terms with their emotions, with their stress level and anxiety level, and to realize, hmm, making a phone call and calling the hairdresser is very nervous making, it's high risk for me. Doing a grammar exercise and looking up the answers and 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 answering maybe this is a low risk for me, but it could be the opposite for, for somebody else, right? And so it's on the one hand, an opportunity for them to self-analyze and 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 realize that there's emotions associated with language, but it's also a research opportunity for us to figure out what's, yeah. So the training, sorry, the training we provide is we just tell them, tell us how you felt at that moment of taking that risk. I raised that issue because I feel like self is such a big point. Mm. So I thought maybe like as a suggestion, because you said it's still piloting, right? The student improvement. So if there was something like that, if I feel, you know, this happens, then this is high risk. Or if that makes me somehow, I don't know, finally educated, then I should be, you know, moving to medium. Because as you said, I might find it quite challenging yeah. for some other person. Yeah, yeah. And the last suggestion, uh, for, for the final thing that they said, um, so you said some people just didn't find it useful. They were maybe just two, but still there are all these people who don't find it maybe fun, maybe useful. But giving them an option to give you feedback, you know, what would make it better if you yeah. know, Absolutely. Had, had a chance to change it. But yeah. for them it is um, Yeah, thank you. That, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. I think Damien, you want to ask a question. I can hear you, but I don't know whether the people at the back. Yeah. Is it working? Okay. So um, some of the risks you, you listed, you decided to take into the list. Um, they were quite specific for this university context. Um, do you think there's the potential 
if you adapt this to other contexts that the list might consist of risks that are too risky in, in the sense that they could lead to a demotivational effect? Would you say it's, it's necessary to consider the general or average level of the students when compiling the risks? In theory, yes. In reality, this is close to impossible because the individual variability and the individual differences of every learner. So we can't really know uh, what is in everyone's mind and what is in everyone's heart. Um, we we just cannot do this analysis, right? And so oftentimes, uh, they the learners themselves cannot do, do this analysis. I'll give you an example. I was when I was learning French. Uh, as a professor, I was hired and I had to learn French and pass my test and all of that. And so I was in a classroom and I was practicing the conditionals and the subjunctive, which is, you know, fairly difficult, fairly advanced in French. And I was comfortable doing that. But then I realized I was too scared to order a croissant in a cafeteria downstairs in that building that we were. And so whether others felt like that, it's so difficult to tell. But I don't see this as a particular problem or a particular challenge because we give them freedom to pick and choose the risks they take. So we tell them, you know, don't do something that, that you know, will, will, will have some sort of negative impact on you, but challenge yourself. Don't also do the easiest thing that's for you. And we really kind of leave it to their autonomous reflective approach to language learning rather than us trying to judge it based on their level. I mean, we have some information about their level of proficiency, but I don't think you can validly, even when you have the information about their level of proficiency, you can't validly guess what is going to make somebody anxious and what is not. So so really, this is our approach to, 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 to this. It's give them a really wide selection of risks don't force them to take them all or really take any of them encourage them to take what is challenging for them and what is going to cause growth for them and allow them also an opportunity to list their own suggestions because there are things that we may not have considered and with with this i think the sky is the limit because they could use it based on the local context, but they could also kind of transfer it to different contexts. And we have people who have said, oh, look, I'm also learning Korean, I'm also learning Spanish, I'm also learning Arabic, and I use, I transfer this concept to my uh, language learning of these other languages. So for me, this is kind of a successful um, feedback that we get. Yeah, and then you also have the opportunity to kind of um, support learners who have made the uh, felt like they failed because you do these assessment sessions in class, right? Exactly, exactly. And we do end of end of semester debrief interviews, and we ask them this question: Was there anything where you failed terribly? And nobody has told us that there was this terrible negative experience. So, still, the notion of risk is has a positive spin uh, in our context. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> I'm moving this way. Um, when you were talking, it reminded me a lot, talking about passport, it reminded me of the portfolio, the European portfolio. Yes. And I was thinking, would there be a possibility to bridge the can-do statements that we have through the portfolio with this risk-taking? I see the difference in the, in, our, in the European portfolio. We have statements like, I can order a cup of coffee, A1. And the statements that you had were obviously in the past tense. I ordered a cup of coffee. Did you think of the can-do statements? Was that an element that you took into consideration? Not necessarily when we were developing this, but of course, eventually this came up. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of entertained that idea. Uh, we, Our focus are is on things that are not so much on people saying what they can do, like you very aptly pointed out, but on things that they actually do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one difference. Whether whether we want to bridge it and link up those statements, I, that idea has come up. We have discussed it. We haven't done it. I, I guess also the, 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 the statements in the European portfolio are also tied to the CFR levels. Yes. And that's something that I'm a little hesitant about doing because again, I think this is such an individualized experience that I don't want to necessarily say, oh, because you're at this level, 
you're taking this risk. I really kind of want to leave it open for them so that they can they can vary um, through the spectrum of the, or the continuum of these risks. But this being said, I'm definitely I I think the the, the statements are very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I could. It's hard to really tell, but but I could see a potential link as a kind of awareness building tool and bridging the concepts. Yeah, so so good question. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks for your informative speech. And I like these kind of, you know, online applications. Uh, so I would like to ask you this. Is there any kind of specific um, language level in which students can start to benefit this? Oh, we don't know. <laughs> and my short and simple answer is that we don't know. Um, we have heard from some students that, uh, some of this is too easy for them. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, just last semester, there was somebody who said, you know, I remember this, I went through this stage, but it was a few years ago. And then I kind of break, I, I broke through and now I don't hesitate. I, I just, I take risks all the time. I'm not too anxious about it. Um, and so it was fun taking this course and it was fun practicing, but it's not like it did something special for me. The fact mm -hmm. that you gave me this app and this passport. Um, it, and this is, again, not a problem in the sense of this person is taking a course when there's a lot of content that they're learning. So it's not like, like as, as, as you notice, we don't really provide any instruction or content. Mm -hmm. We just give uh, examples of authentic risks that they can take. Um, so, it, it, yeah, I, th I think at a very high level, this may not be very um, useful for some learners. But at the same time, I always feel like even if you're at a very high level, you always have more things to learn and more things that are challenging for you, right? Yeah. So if you're reflective enough, you will find something that still uh, uh, stresses you out or something that makes you uncomfortable. And in that case, you should go for it, give it a try, and, and then have that skill under your belt as well. So that's, yeah, the best I can say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Michael, did you want to put some questions? Can you hear me, everyone? Okay, I've got three or four questions. Um, first of all, I've got two questions where they are asking for a link mm -hmm. for the presentation. Okay, mm -hmm. and they have been answered by the ICC in your email. So Perfect. they can contact you. Yes. Is that okay with yes, you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Fine. And Ross has quite, let me see where Ross is. Question. How much research have you done into the, correl and into the correlation between risk-taking in general and enthusiasm for linguistic risk-taking? For example, does your questionnaire include questions like, do you invest in crypto? Or do you enjoy base B A S E jumping? Is there evidence to show that risk averse or fixed mindset individuals are unsuited to the linguistic linguistic risk taking? Wow. Well, Thank you. I've got it in writing also. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The whole... I, I, I understood the question it's very quite... well. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you. So this is a very good question. My answer is no and none. Uh, we have definitely not done any research on this. Uh, we have not tried to correlate them. And I wonder if we're even interested in doing that. I'm a little hesitant about doing that because our concept is we position linguistic risk taking as something that is safe and fun. We like, like, like I gave you the example of my experience with the barber. What's the worst that can happen? He can kind of laugh at me, maybe not be particularly nice uh, about it and kind of make me feel a little bit like, oh, well, I was, I was silly. I was embarrassed about, you know, making that mistake. But in the end of the day, it's still a positive experience for me. If I invest in cryptocurrency and lose my money and, and have to, you know, mortgage my house or sell my house uh, or, you know, become homeless, that's a very different type of risk. And that's not the type of risk that I want to necessarily encourage. And I don't want to link people's thinking 
uh, I don't want people to link ling in linguistic risk taking to this type of risky behaviors, right? I mean, if we go into like drugs, alcohol, sex, and things like that, there's a lot of risky behaviors that has to be, that have to uh, we have to do everything possible to avoid. But with linguistic risk taking, I think I think we're building a different construct that I don't want to be associated with risky behaviors. The other part of the question was. Um, what about pers a person's kind of personality? Are they more of a risk taken taker or are they more risk averse? And here again, I mean, this is it, it is quite challenging to to do research like this. You have to do quite sophisticated psychological research to make these links. But my thinking is that again, I'm hesitant. I'm not sure if I want to do this because I think this project has something for everyone the the risk taker and the risk averse person even the 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 the, the, the if, if, if even the risk taker profile would have maybe some situation in the passport that speaks to them something that is challenging to them linguistically that they may not have thought about in terms of practicing their 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 um risk taking skills linguistic risk taking skills um and maybe when they use the app they would mark it as low risk every every risk they take they they would mark it as low risk right we haven't actually found that user yet in the app that marks everything as low risk but in theory that will be the case and then the risk Averse person obviously would maybe more cautiously go through the risk list of ring linguistic risks and thing and choose things that, that 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 are more within their comfort zone or slightly outside of their comfort zone. And this is when our in-class coaching comes in because when we talk about how can we teach these 21st century skills in the classroom, the classroom is very important because it's it's the place where these reflections and when these strategic coaching sessions happen where we address these questions uh, with the learners and hopefully equip them to tackle them well in real life. I hope I, I hope I answered well, but I'm th this is something that I have thought about previously. So if you have further thoughts or suggestions, don't hesitate to to email me uh, about this because it's very interesting to me. It's Ross. It's from Ross again. Am I correct that the app only works if you have an Ottawa Uni email address? Can you say this again? Am I correct that the app only works if you have an Ottawa University email address? That is correct. The The app uh, is currently only for uh, uh, users who are at the University of Ottawa and, and, and have a University of Ottawa email address. There's a number of reasons for doing this, but we do allow um, testers from outside of our institution. So uh, if you are uh, interested in doing this, you can email us uh, at the at my email address directly or at the project email address. And then with, you know, a sufficient justification of the reasons and an explanation of the, the rationale, we do allow other people to, to take a look and test it. So, um, so that's possible. Yeah. So questions can be asked directly now. So Ross, if you don't mind, you can open your uh, microphone and ask the question that that you have. You have one more on the chat. Thank you for that. And thank you for your answer, Nikolai. One last question then before I'm sure many other people have questions to you. I hope you can give a quick answer to this one. Uh, my question is, after your answer, your very helpful answer, thank you, should we or should you consider a rebrand for linguistic risk taking that doesn't include the danger word risk? Should we for perhaps consider calling it taking ling linguistic challenges? Why, why, is the, why do you prefer the word risk? Um, yeah, I mean, in fact, this is what, for example, the ECML has done. They have definitely rebranded uh, the, the, the terminology and they did call it uh, um, handbook of of, lingu of language challenges right um i do think so terms and labels are important i do think that the uh, term linguistic risk is important and it speaks better to me and maybe to learners um in the sense that it tackles a slightly different concept than the lure, than the word challenge. Um, as I explained earlier on this slide where I showed the two sides of the coin, for me, the term linguistic risk is important because it packages, it encapsulates both the anxiety and the pleasure 
Uh, and to me, linguistic risk take very nicely represents this uh, um, continuum or these two sides of the coin. The word challenge is perhaps used more often and more broadly and doesn't necessarily uh, um, encapsulate these two sides of the coin for me. And that's why I think that the term linguistic risk is more appropriate and it speaks more directly to our emotions about this. I may be wrong because I have not validated this theory uh, through you know, sophisticated uh, psychological work basically, but this is my answer at this point. Thank you, Ross. Thank, Thank you. you. One final question. Is there a free trial, free experimental trial? Of the app? I assume, uh, feel free to email me and we can discuss. Um, I would like to point out that the recordings, uh, uh, that the presentations are all being recorded and will be uploaded on the YouTube ICC channel. So you can hear Nikolai's talk as often as you want and gain new insights. If I'm allowed, I would like to make one comment and perhaps ask my colleagues here if they have experienced the same thing. Living in Germany and working in Germany, I think it is very difficult to get our German students taking more risks. They do not like to live with uncertainties. I mean, I'm generalizing, but it is a fact. It's not only the students that would have problems with talking and not being 100% correct, but we also have the other side of the coin where it's where we have new teachers making sure that even at the A1, they're 100% correct and they would correct everything that they say. So we really have two sides. I do not know whether my colleagues would say this is something perhaps German, German or whether it, I mean, I'm Mediterranean. We would have no problem with saying anything in any language with lots of mistakes, but I find this is a difficulty in Germany. Mm -hmm. Sorry, may I? It's, I, I, I am I'm a hundred percent convinced that overcorrecting or sometimes even correcting at all people is damaging, um, and comparing them to native speakers is damaging. I avoid that term. I avoid setting that standard, uh, and 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 our project definitely falls within these lines. If you remember the statements that we included in the passport that have circulated, say things like, "I'm not a native speaker of this language, and I'm okay with that. I'm not a native speaker of this language, and I still call myself bilingual, even if my the two languages are not equal uh, in my language repertoire." Again, the insight from plurilingualism, for example. Um, I am not afraid to make errors; they are natural and normal. Uh, for language use. In fact, I used to say, I'm proud of the errors that I make, but a colleague of mine told me, well, Nikolai, don't push it that hard. So I changed it. But really, I, I think there's a lot of change of mindset that we all need to go through. And my, my, I think this is a really interesting, valid comment that we, we all need to grow. Uh, in this regard. And I think it should be an important part in teacher education, yeah. in teaching programs. When new teachers come to our programs, for example, your author, they should really have this mm. upfront thing, um, authenticity, correction, feeling, um, yeah, not going into risks and so on. I think then we do not have any more questions, then we can have our nice coffee break. Perhaps we can actually go outside because the sun is shining and we should be back just before 11 o'clock where we start with, no with another presentation by two ladies. Um, so see you at about what, five to 11. Yeah, yeah. And before you're leaving the room, I wish to thank Nikolai. <laughs> Very much indeed for that inspiring thank you. speech. Thank, oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and thank you again. for coming to Belgrade and to having yeah. that link with the ICC. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. This yeah. is great. So I think <laughs>